Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Demon Hunters uh, role-playing game, A Comedy of Terrors uh, Demon Master Workshop. Um, this is essentially uh, a how-to run the game, um, and we will be going over a few kind of basic things. Um, we'll go over character creation. Uh, we will go over some basics on how the game works. Um, and how to utilize some of the fun stuff that goes along. We will be able to create some uh, NPCs. In this game, we call them Demon Master Characters, DMCs. And then we will finally get into actually making some missions. And I'll, I'll show you how to generate uh, your own Demon Hunters mission. And we'll kind of go over some, some uh, fun... Uh, fun mix of, of different kinds of things there. Uh, people will be joining us uh, off and on, and uh, these folks will be uh, running the game at Gen Con and various other places uh, in the next couple of weeks, so welcome. Uh, you can hear me? I can hear you. <clears throat> Excellent, thank you. I'm right. Need to throw my headphones on here just to make sure I don't get any feedback. This Mac does pretty good, but you never can tell. Yeah, I have the same problem. Ah, much better. I think. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so. Uh, okay, and then those of you who may be watching, presently that is zero people, uh, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, there is, uh, there's typically a kind of a delay that happens. Um, so if you're just catching this, there is a Q&A function. You can uh, enter your questions there. If you're watching us on YouTube, uh, there is going to be a little window that pops up down at the bottom that says, be a part of the conversation. You can click on that, and it will take you to the Hangout. And the Hangout is where you can um, enter your questions and that sort of thing. Um, OK. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and get started with the first section of this, and that is character creation. And character creation is pretty easy. Uh, if you are uh, at all, well, first I should back up. Um, I, I haven't really talked about what the game is and what the setting is. So if you're not really familiar with uh, either of these things or you're, you're loosely familiar, let's get some basics down. And that is that the setting is our present day world. And uh, with the caveat that uh, anything, uh, all the religions, all the folklore, um, all of the, the urban legends, they're all true at the same time. And so every werewolf, every vampire, every um, Cthulhu, all that stuff exists. Um, and there is a secret organization called the Brotherhood of the Celestial Torch that... Um, it's essentially kind of our agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and they hunt and keep back the nightmares of the night uh, from you even knowing that they exist. And your job is to play one of those agents, essentially. And uh, Jimmy McMichael has joined us. He is one of our world, is the world creator uh, presently. Um, oh. So he'll be able to answer canonical questions. <laughs> and uh, glad you showed up, uh, Jimmy, actually, because uh, given sort of booth talk and everything, um, exactly. this, this might be a good might be a good little uh, primer for that. <clears throat> okay, and so then the game itself, so that's the world. The world is our world, and monsters are real. It's kind of like Supernatural and Ghostbusters uh, and Buffy, but uh, that uh, where supernatural kind of limits it just to the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, Demon Hunters is everything. Everything exists. It's all real. And it's all equally dangerous and will, wants to eat and kill you. So um, now the mechanics uh, of the game, the engine itself, is very 
uh, based on fate and fate accelerated. Uh, so if you're familiar with that, you're going to feel pretty right at home. Uh, the primary difference is that we are using polyhedrals, and there are a couple of game systems that are fate hacks that kind of do that. Um, and so we're just adding to the pot, I guess, on that one. Um, and, with, and then there's a couple other kind of funny um, sort of house rule kind of things that we've made part of our game. Um, and so we'll get into that uh, momentarily. But it's a very story-driven game, very um, less, probably less crunch and more um, player choices and things like that. Uh, but there's definitely enough structure, I think, uh, to be able to make decisions and have a fun game. So now we'll get into char character creation. So character creation really has four different parts. And I'm going to pull up a character sheet. And I will share that screen now that we actually have a character sheet to show. It's very exciting. Okay. Presume everybody can see that well enough. Yeah, good. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, obviously, you'll type your name in there, and you can, as far as the description goes, uh, you can come back to this or whatever, but just whatever that you want to throw in there is, as far as your character. Um, uh, probably where most people will start is this box here. And this is these are your approaches. Uh, kind of looks a little bit like uh, physical stats and mental stats sometimes, but in this game, it's it's really about how you are approaching your conflict or, or the challenge um, that you're about to face. And so you will have a, a d10, two die eights, two die sixes, and a d4 that you will assign in these boxes here. Uh, and you'll decide, you know, if you are, uh, if your D10 is, if you're going to be a brawler, maybe you'll want to put that in forceful. And so maybe your D4 will be in careful. Maybe you're not quite as careful. There's a ton of different ways you can sign it, assign it, but it basically works like a, a stat array. Um, and that is found in the book. And the book is, there's a beta that is uh, available to download at the moment, and I'll post a link to that uh, once this video is over. So, <clears throat> D10, two die eights, two die sixes, and a D4, assign, you're done. Now, uh, next comes your disciplines, and this is kind of like uh, different departments of the Brotherhood, you might think about, um, uh, different parts of the organization that you work for. And you're going to have expertise in these areas. Uh, you're going to have knowledge, expertise, um, and uh, ex experience um, in that. And the way you represent that is with a D10, a D8, and a D6. And then everything else is a D4. Um, and what that means is that each of these departments, say for instance combat and tactics, that encompasses everything that you can think of about combat and tactics. So if you want to fight something, if you want to, um, if you want to know strat, you know combat strategy, uh, it's it's knowledge and it's uh, your actions that you want to try and do. Same thing with covert ops. This is your very spy stuff. Your sneaky. Uh, abilities that you might do. Uh, you might use covert ops to do some hacking, um, to lose a tail if you're being chased, um, those kind of things, break into uh, locks and doors and various other stuff. Mystic Arts is your catch-all for anything magic or supernatural empowered related. So if you're a psychic, if you are um, uh, if you're a practitioner of the arts, uh, or if you're just really knowledgeable about the occult, um, this is where you're going to um, put your emphasis in here. You'll know about rituals, you'll know about um, uh, various you know, history and all that kind of stuff. Research and development, this is your tech. This is where 
I, you can build stuff. You maybe you're just really book knowledgey and you know how to to uh, research and and create new things. Um, this you could also use this for things like mechanics if you're good at repairing or building, um, that sort of thing. Social engineering. Uh, that word is not uh, uh, accidental. This is um, really about uh, social manipulation, and um, so you could use this whenever you're trying to be influential, charismatic, diplomatic. You could use this uh, for situations like gambling um, or seduction. Um, anytime you're, you know. Political rallies, whatever it is, um, social engineering is, is kind of where you're wanting to sway people to your way. And then finally, fringe, and fringe is the catch-all for everything that's weird. Um, so if you are a vampire, then you would put vampire here. If you are a werewolf, you put werewolf here. If you're a succubus, you put succubus there. If you're a cipher, you put cipher there. Um, but just because now I think that's a there's a an interesting thing about that. It, even if you are one of those things, but they don't happen to be a major part of who your character is. I mean, it's part of it, but uh, it doesn't. It's not so much in their identity. You don't actually have to put a discipline for that weird thing that you are. Um, if you you know if you're a werewolf and you have it under control and um, you know, you do what you need to do, and really, your thing is about um, fighting and being a spy or whatever, and, and being a, a wizard or something. Uh, then those are going to be your three things, and then we'll take care of uh, like a werewolf ability, probably under aspect or stunt, um, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, but if if you want to do werewolfy things like regenerate or turn into a werewolf or whatever it is that you want to utilize uh, in the uh, in, in other words that you would make a roll on uh, then um, maybe putting choosing one of your uh, disciplines as a fringe would be a good idea before I move on to the next two things, uh, I'd like to open it up to questions so far, because the disciplines, there's a lot there. Um, I feel like they're fairly straightforward, but uh, I've been immersed in it for over a year and a half. So. <laughs> hey, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hello? All right. I, I just messed man up my mic the, and everything. Man in the dark? That is, that is me. <laughs> oh, the shadow's eating half your face. I know the shadow. Anyways, <clears throat> um, uh, okay. So disciplines. So is the combat tactics discipline? Is that somebody's like? I'm going to sneakily sneak up somebody and stab them in the back, and they're like, "Well, I have a ten in covert ops, but like a four in combat in tactics." Mm -hmm. Would sneakily walking up behind somebody and stabbing them in the back would that? Would I just be okay use covert ops? Like you would want to use covert ops? Um, my rule of thumb on that is if you can justify it as a player um, mm -hmm. and it makes sense, then yeah, you could do that. Um, so you have uh, an approach sneaky, so you're going to take your sneaky die and then um, because I'm a spy, I know how to um, stab people in the back without them knowing and uh, it's a matter of subterfuge and whatever, assassin yeah. type of things. Absolutely, you could do that. So uh, having a particular aspect that you know helps you define that would really help you make that case, right? Definitely, definitely. Yep. Uh, oh, another thing, I, the fringe discipline is really giving me a hard time because I feel like it could be used for basically anything ever, like... The other ones have their sort of vague yet somewhat defined area of expertise. But somebody's like, "I'm a vampire. I can I can sneak around. I can rip people's throats out. I can walk up walls." Yep. That's the, the the anything discipline. That's right. That's, that's exactly what it is. You have a very keen grasp of it. <laughs> 
There appears, appears to be no confusion. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you're a vampire and you can walk up walls, you're going to use your vampire discipline to do that. Okay. Yeah. But you'd also be saying, yes, every other vampire can walk up walls. <laughs> True. Yeah. Unless for some reason they can't. Right. Yeah. Okay. And um, as I know there's faith dice, but okay, in Mystic Arts, it's sort of the catch-all for mystical powers, psionic ability, anything that's not normal. Mm -hmm. Is there anything for divine powers? Like if somebody's... Because, I mean, the, the order sort of has this sort of vaguely... Uh, divine background to it anyways, but somebody's like, I'm a priest who can call down holy bolts of yep. god lightning. Was th would that fall under Mystic Arts too? Yep, yep. that's all I can. Right. Yeah, Mystic Arts, uh, and maybe this is something to that we ought to think about. Uh, in fact, I think um, Cam and I were discussing calling it Mystic just mystic or mm -hmm. uh, mysticism or something like that uh, because it, it and maybe mystic arts is just fine it's not just uh, magic or psychic but it's also holy it's also extra, religious extra normal abilities yeah because it also encode yeah like it includes psychic powers which aren't magical yeah, yeah. It, it might be that it would be really helpful to make sure the characters um, Make a clear aspect that explains the the justification yeah. for their mystical abilities. So that way, it would be easy to to judge exactly where it was coming from and how it worked. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And I'm going to talk about aspects momentarily, uh, but that's a that's a very good point. It would really help clarify all that. Mm -hmm. um, we just want to give it a broad enough category or name, Mystic Arts, there to catch it all. But it's you know, <clears throat> and I what what is the line between a a discipline and a stunt? Like if somebody's like, I like wants to throw a magic missile or a, a bolt of energy at somebody, and you're like, well, that's that's the same thing anybody else can do with a gun. So roll flashy and mystic arts, and that's fine. What right. if they're like, I'm gonna blow up the entire room with a fireball, and would that we say, well, you should probably have a stunt for that, or is it just like, all right, somebody with a grenade could do that, so go I would, right ahead. Once again, um, I've, we're getting into good questions about aspects and stunts, so I think I'll probably move on to okay. that Sorry. section. But um, but to answer your question, I would say you're going to use a stunt if your character specializes in a particular thing. Um, uh, that's a defining thing about what you do, Um uh, and so, like, you know, the character Wolf has a stunt that um, he he can once per session throw something and it explodes. <laughs> it can be anything. Okay. So, um, you know, it's just about like what is what is a defining thing about your character. So let's get into stunt or uh, excuse me aspects. And I'm going to go ahead and share this screen again. <clears throat> Okay, so aspects. Uh, we've got blocks here for five of them. You only need one to start the game, but uh, it's helpful that you can fill out all five. If, uh, and uh, for the purposes of playtesting, we'll already have uh, pre-generated characters, and it'll all be all there. But if you are creating from scratch, um, your, your first and primary required aspect is your concept. Uh, and what's nice is we've got little tags here to tell you what kind of aspect it should be. So concept is your general um, general defining aspect about who you are. And aspects are, well, they're aspects. They're, they're defining features about your character that you can tag uh, to gain a bonus or uh, to endure hardship. Um, you, it kind of goes both ways. And so your concept is going to be kind of a general, you know, who you are as a character. Um, Jimmy, what was your uh, new uh, character's concept 
Uh, totally not a shaved Bigfoot. Totally not a shaved Bigfoot. <laughs> that is the concept. Totally. Yeah, totally not a shaved Bigfoot. Um, so <clears throat> aspects, if you're not familiar with fate, can be a little bit tricky to get because it's going to feel really super open-ended. Um, but one thing you might think about is just, uh, you know, with your concept, like Silent Jim, he's mysterious, he's uh, a gunslinger, he knows how to use guns, so oh, we'll start with guns. So he's a gunslinger. Um, you could then throw in a descriptor, mysterious gunslinger. Um, and then... You know, you could even expound out from there. Uh, you know, what is about your character? Um, Wolf might be um, macho badass or something. Um, so that's your concept. Your trouble is going to be um, just as it sounds, uh, a, a, an aspect that it will get you in trouble more than probably help you. Um, and that's actually going to be helpful when we get into using aspects and gaining faith dice, uh, because you can you can endure, you can um, call upon these aspects to provide to make things more complicated for you, and you can gain gain a bonus from that. And then you're going to have uh, three aspects. Uh, that is one that each of them are going to be tied to a, you know each of your disciplines. So as Scott was talking about earlier, um, if you had mystic arts, you would want to create an aspect that's tied to mystic arts and kind of define about you know if you have mystic arts and that's a D8 for you, maybe the mystic art discipline here will be holy roller or something. Or far better aspect writing than I'm throwing out examples here. But um, aspect, there's a whole section in the book about writing good aspects. Uh, there's tons and tons of material out there for Fate and Fate Accelerated on writing good aspects. But essentially, you don't want them just to be nouns. You want the, them to be descriptive. Uh, when you write them, you want to be able to think about. Um, can somebody use this aspect against me? And, uh, and can I also call upon the aspect to help me? So can they go both ways? Kind of thing. And I'm going to go ahead and pause right there. Um, and kind of talk, kind of open it up a little bit to those who are familiar with aspect writing and creating aspects and just see if anybody has anything else to add about that. Yeah, I've been playing Fate for a very long time, so I mean, I, 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 I think what I find is that uh, you don't want aspects that are overly obscure. I mean, I mm -hmm. think that they need to at least maybe in your home game people can understand what you're talking about when you do obscure musical references right. but, but typically you want something that's that's easy to recognize you know uh, alcoholic uh, young vampire on a mission there you go or something that you know easily you can easily see that it has problems it has advantages it creates story and situation immediately upon you know it, you being invested in something is going to cause interesting problems. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think at least especially for when you're trying to explain it to people, you know, this is you know, especially the concept. This is who you are. Yeah. And you know, people are often complex and messy, and you know, there's going to be good and bad things about people. Right. I have a question. Um. Right, so enduring with an aspect, is that like, that's like compelling in fate, right? Where you compel an aspect, you tag an aspect to compel somebody to act as their aspect would normally imply they would. Like if you're like an angry badass and you're like, 
well, you're an angry badass, so I'm going to compel your aspect to so you go attack those people. Is that the same thing as enduring? We don't have compels in Demon Hunters, uh, but um, you're in the neighborhood of the right idea. So enduring means that something is happening to your character um, that you um, are... Well, I'll get into the, the mechanics of it, but uh, the, the idea is that... I suppose it, it might be a, a similar thing, just a different way of looking at it. Uh, someone could say, um, um, you know, I have that aspect of overweight, bald uh, werewolf, mm -hmm. um, which we have one of those in the game. <laughs> and so uh, someone, uh, so you can actually, so instead of someone tagging that, somebody else tagging that and saying, um, I'm going to use this against you. They can do that, but it's more going to be they know this about you, and therefore they're going to use it against you. They might, and so they get a bonus from that. When you endure, you're saying, okay, I'm an overweight, bald werewolf. That means that I have, you know, um, I, I eat to feel better. And I have self-conscious issues about my baldy. I'm bald even when I'm a werewolf, and so you know, how how awful is that? And so in this situation, I'm in a room full of desserts and cupcakes, and um, I'm I'm not feeling. Maybe I have a condition, um, paranoid or something, and so um, I'm I'm going to I'm going to tag my own aspect and endure it. And what that means is I'm going to roll my approach and my discipline, but I'm not going to add them together. I'm just going to take the higher of the two as my result. And it's because of that aspect uh, that I'm, I'm doing this okay. that I, I will gain a fate point or a fate die. Okay. Yeah, that's really helpful. I must have completely missed that. Yeah. Okay. okay, so the player chooses when they want to endure an aspect to risk something negative happening to them, but if they succeed anyways, they get their faith die back. Um, you're not, no, so this is, when you're endure, all you're really doing is gaining a faith die. No, no, I know. Wait, so failing a endure, so, okay, so like, if in that situation you're surrounded by food or whatever, mm -hmm. what is the opposition to that role, or is there an opposition to that role? Sure, there's always going to be. Okay. I mean, if it's if it's going to create something interesting for that scene, so might... let's, let's say it's like enchanted food that's right. been le left there by like a lotus eater clan or something, whatever. Right. Yeah, or, or you're distracted and you don't notice the ninjas dropping on right. top of exactly. your Right, exactly. Right. So yeah. you say that's an opposition ten. If they fail, something bad happens. But if they succeed, they get their faith die, and they're not distracted or uh, enchanted by the food or whatever. The very fact that they're enduring, yeah, they, they get the faith die. Okay, then what are you rolling for? You're rolling, um, uh, again, to... Uh, so in this situation, you may be distracted, and you're rolling on this, and the um, in this situation, ninjas are coming down, you don't notice, um, and you're, roll you're enduring this aspect... Uh, and if you fail, you are binging on sweets and cakes while terribleness is happening around you, and you might, you know, get stabbed or something. Um, Wait, does enduring apply to any situation, and that's just when they take the low or the highest of the two dice instead of adding them together? Like, can you always endure if your aspect applies to that situation? If you want to. Okay, I t I thought it was like a situational. Like, I thought it was like um, a compel. Oh, so it's more like cortex. Right, right, okay. That makes sense now. Yeah. I, I was thinking of it like fate compels that, yeah. Right, yeah. 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 Now, there there are going to be, uh, um, what are we calling those, invokes. Mm -hmm. So uh, an enemy can invoke an aspect of yours and if they know about it, and right. um, then they will just, you know, get that D6 on their roll and will make things harder for you. Yeah. But it's because of that aspect that you have. That's probably the closest thing. There's no 
external, I'm making you do this because of your aspect. You have to be that way okay. from that. That, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, we don't have that in, in this game. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any other questions or clarifications about aspects before we move on? No, but I definitely want to make sure we walk through all the different, uh, like, do you, do you have some kind of cheat sheet on the actual mechanics and the flow and how things happen? Because I've read through the rules once fully and I missed that entirely and I don't want to, I don't want to miss something like that when we're actually at the table. Um, I'm, I'm, not sure there is a particular cheat sheet, but okay. um, I'll talk to Cam and find out. But I think, uh, yeah, yeah. I mainly <laughs> just want to don't want to miss those edge cases when people make choices and how they use them. Right. I think the whole mechanic of how to roll is pretty simple, but um, w when you do different things. Yeah. Matters. Well, uh, maybe when when I when I get into explaining the rules a little bit more and how to play. Sure, that'd uh, be great. Maybe, Maybe we'll uh, get into that. So let's uh, let's move on to the fourth um, identifying factor of your character sheet. Um, so the fourth step in creating your character, and that is stunts. And stunts are really uh, they're sort of specialty moves. They are uh, special abilities that your character might have, and there's basically kind of two formats that you can choose to write a stunt. Um, but you're not limited to this, but most people want some kind of formula to, to get into it. Uh, this sheet doesn't really show you that formula all that well, uh, but it's, it's explained in the book. And the first uh, part of the, in fact, I have a cheat sheet somewhere around here that actually has this. Here we go. Um, character creation cheat sheet, and I will share that this time instead of the character sheet. There we go. Okay. So once again, uh, just kind of four things to your character. And here's the, the bit about stunts. So you could write up to three stunts, or however many devotion you have. It's helpful to start with at least one. Now, I'm using that language because in a, in a regular game, if you're creating your character, sometimes you want to discover things about your character. And so you might save those other two stunts or one stunt um, uh, for a little bit later to figure out what you want to do. Um, but uh, but if you want to, you could write up to three stunts, because every character, for the most part, is going to start out with three devotion, which just tells you uh, that you have three faith dice to start with. And the first format is, because I am blank, you have to describe something about your character, because I am a fat werewolf, uh, I get a plus two to my choose an approach. Let's call it flashy. When I attack, overcome, create advantage or defend. So when I flashily overcome, uh, uh, and then you fill in a situation, um, overcome an obstacle while um, you know not binging on something. It's a terrible stunt, but the, <clears throat> the format is because I am say something about your character, I get a plus two to choose an approach, careful, clever, flashy, forceful, quick, sneaky. When I, and you, and you do one of the four actions in the game, you choose one of those, attack, defend, overcome, or create an advantage. And then it has to be in a more specific situation. Um, and so... Uh, let me see if I can pull up in the same thing. We have uh, playtest characters. And so just to give a couple of examples. So here's Gabriel. 
because I have nothing to lose, oh, excuse me, uh, let's go down here to uh, this one here. Because I'm a natural leader, I get a plus two when I quickly create advantage that benefits my team members. Um, let's see here, rigor mortis. Because I'm a ninja warrior, I get a plus two when I carefully attack from the shadows. Um, Bijou, because I'm ready for the apocalypse, I get a plus two when I cleverly create an advantage with medical or scientific supplies. So that's the first uh, format that you can create a stunt. Um, and it's probably the easiest because there's less open-ended stuff to think about. Um, another one here. Because I am superhumanly strong, I get a plus two when I forcefully overcome an obstacle. I have one extra stress box, and I'm never exhausted. Um, now, that doesn't apply so much because uh, these are old versions of the characters and uh, the conditions and stress uh, is different. But, um, but this might say he has one extra uh, condi mild condition box, um, which is... Uh, so you, because of a stunt, you can, you can gain a little bit more can extra ask abilities. Question? Yeah. Uh, it looks like in that example, and then in one of the examples in the books, they were uh, they were different from kind of the standard set. Mm -hmm. um, how was how do you decide that's available, or how to how to do such a thing? Um, is that something that's going to be going in the main book as, as y'all expand on it? Yeah, I mean, we're probably uh, Cam's probably going to uh, define that a little bit more, um, but I think. <clears throat> Like when we when we think about in terms of some of these characters who are nigh on godlike in some ways, there's got to be some way to um, provide some sort of you know benefit to that. But then they're going to have to make up for it in other areas. You know, um, uh, maybe they just suck more at something else or something. Uh, uh, you know, ciphers are another one where I think you know ciphers are nearly indestructible, um, and so they're just going to have a lot of stress box or a lot of condition boxes. Um, but they're also, you know, a quirky pain in the ass uh, piece of equipment. So, um, you know, there there is a bit of a trade off. But I don't at the moment. I'm not aware of any specific hard and fast rule of when to do that. It's uh, Cam's catch-all is discuss it with your uh, demon master and decide if that's appropriate or whatever. So definitely something to uh, work over for the final book. Um, I know he's working on more examples and fleshing things out, so that's a, that's a really good question. And we are recording this today, so uh, I'll have Cam watch all of this and make sure that... Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Um, no. Okay. So the second uh, format of the stunt, which is uh, more open-ended and uh, more overwhelming to some people, is uh, because I am, once again, fill in the blank about something about your character, I get to do something awesome within reason. And so typically our sample characters have been, uh, because I am fill in the blank, once per game session or once per um, conflict uh, or something, I can, I can do something amazing. Um, so let's take a look at a couple of examples uh, Come on. Come back, window. Thank you. Where did it go? Where are Boom. All right. <clears throat> so, because I am the embodiment of mega violence, once per game session, I can make something explode when I throw it. Wolf. Um... Gabriel, because I have nothing to lose once per game session, I can re-roll 
all the faith dice and demon dice on either my action or an ally's action and keep the highest total. That's pretty cool. Uh, Silent Jim. Because I exist outside of time, once per game session, I can die in some horrible fashion instead of taking conditions, um, and then come back in the next scene healed of all conditions, essentially. These are big deals, uh, kind of thing. Um, Bijou, because I have a relationship with Loa, once per game session, I can switch any two approaches with one another for the remainder of the current scene. Interesting. Because I have vampiric vitality once per conflict, so once per fight, I can reroll a faith die and recover that many conditions in our game. Stress boxes have gone away. Once per game session, because I have lycanthric viral load once per game session, I can reroll my approach die twice for my action uh, if I have conditions. Minor conditions. And those are stunts. Okay, I have a question about that side of the stunts, way more than the sort of standard bonus right. stunts. Yes. That, As I expect, most people will have questions in that regard. Yeah, they just... That seems so powerful, but so sort of just dependent on whoever created the character. Like, one person's like, oh, I can I can heal all my serious, whatever, I can heal all my conditions, and somebody else is like, I can kill everyone always once per session. Yeah. Um, I, I think the key to that, and um, I think the examples may evolve a little bit from what I just showed you, uh, the the recently the players for the DG game night where we get together and play this uh, once yeah. a month, uh, they just uh, invented their own um, stunts and sort of found that um, it was a lot easier to utilize and um, and uh, come up with since it was your own character, and I think some things that you know that I heard that were more helpful is you can do this amazing, powerful thing, but it should be in a very specific situation. So you shouldn't be able to do it always, right. um, but you should be able to do it when that particular situation arises. Um, that might be a good guideline, um, you know. But sometimes it seems almost like like flavor text, like. Wolf's thing, where once per session he can throw anything he wants and it'll explode. But I mean, they don't, there, aren't, there aren't rules for like area attacks necessarily in this. So right, mm -hmm. that just seems very flavorful, but not necessarily like Silent Jim compared to Wolf. Silent Jim's thing is crazy amazing, and Wolf's thing is like I can explode anything I want, but that's not as effective necessarily. Well, I mean, it's just, uh, I think it would depend on how you decide, to, you know. I mean, it could be a beer can throws and explodes a car behind him. Um, in one session, a uh, wolf grabbed, I think it was Ned, <laughs> when he jumped out of an airplane or a helicopter and threw Ned at a um, oil field platform. And and it exploded. <laughs> okay. You know, I ruined the entire second act of the, <laughs> the game, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> you had <it> planned. <laughs> Pretty much. I, I rescind my objection. So it's really just it depends on the situation and what you want to have happen. And okay. You know, in that in that case, you know, uh, with Ned, he can say because I am. Um, uh, yeah, that's true, Jimmy. But I don't have. It's it's not formatted, so it'll look like a bunch of gobbledygook. Gotcha. Um, Jimmy said I should use the uh, updated profiles, and he's right. But it just looks like code. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, 
so that's character creation in a nutshell, um, as fast as I can get through it. Um, I'm going to now go over real quick uh, the other areas of your character sheet, but these won't really go into play um, when you're creating your character. You should just be aware of what's on there. So up here um, towards the top, uh, you'll fill in your, your chapter number, your designation, whatever you choose. The devotion here, unless you have a stunt that says otherwise, uh, your devotion will be three, which means that up here in your faith dice section, you'll have three, and this is just where you keep track of how many faith dice you have. Um, and then here's conditions. Now, most people are going to have the capacity for three mild conditions, two moderate conditions, one severe condition. And milds are up for up to five hits, moderates are up to ten hits each, and severe are up to fifteen hits each. Um, so I'll get into what a hit is in a moment, but the reason why there's a checkbox and a blank there is because you end up creating an, a temporary aspect um, called a condition, and that can be you know, a flesh wound, or, um, you know, paranoid, or hungry, um, or if you're, it's, if it's a moderate, it might be a um, broken arm, or something, um, uh, or it could be uh, a, a demolished reputation, if it's a social situation, or something like that. Um, so, um, so those are those are essentially what uh, the conditions that where you'll record those uh, and um, once all of your conditions are used up, you're taken out um, for that scene for the um, for the session. That and by taken out, that could be death, that could be a severe condition, uh, or it could be just that you're unconscious and you're chained up to a car or something. I don't know. Um, you're abducted. That's really all I have to say about the character sheet. Um, I think the rest of this will get a little bit more clear uh, when we get into discussing how the game works. Um, so, how the game works. Uh, in any particular conflict or, or challenge, uh, You'll be doing one of two things, really. You'll either be ro rolling opposed roles between you and something else, uh, or someone else, uh, or you'll be rolling against an, a static opposition number. Um, and static opposition numbers are our version of like a difficulty level or a difficulty class, DC. Um, so the opposition, uh, an easy would be five, um, regular would be 10, um, and so on. So it goes in increments of five. As you can imagine, uh, so if you have a difficulty or a, an opposition 10, then the way that you go about beating that opposition is you grab an approach die and you grab a discipline die. And you roll those and add them together. And as you can imagine, if you're dealing with D10s, D8s, and D6s, uh, getting a total of 10 can be a challenge. Um, it's meant to be that way. Uh, this game is supposed to be uh, difficult and challenging and brutal and that sort of thing. So if you're only using those two things, that's what is represented there. Um, but uh, as with on the character sheet, there's going to be a number of ways that you might approach one single particular opposition. Um, just because you your highest die might be enforceful, you may decide that you need to be clever in this particular uh, situation. Um, and you might use the same discipline die that you would have with forceful, but here you're going to use clever instead. Um, and so that's essentially what you're going to be doing. If you're rolling opposite to somebody else, uh, that means you're either 
uh, overcoming or attacking. They might be defending. Or the reverse is true. Uh, they might be trying to create an advantage on you or attacking you. Um, and, and Or if you're creating an advantage and they want to overcome that, then, you know, but it's opposed roles. And <clears throat> so you both roll. And whoever gets the highest wins. And um, uh, so if if you are attacking and the other person is defending, and you roll higher than they do, then you sh subtract those two numbers, and whatever is the remainder are what is called hits. And um, so that might be two hits, or five hits, or seven hits, um, and they have to deal with those uh, by marking off a condition and writing out what they have. Uh, and so let's say, for instance, you were hit, uh, you defended on an 8, and the, the uh, enemy hit you with a 13, so that's a, or let's say 14, make it 6. So now you have 6 hits to deal with, and you have 3 mild condition boxes, and 1 moderate, and 1, or 2 moderate, and 1 uh, uh, severe. So you would probably mark off two mild conditions because um, even if you have one hit, uh, you still have to utilize a, a full box. And so now you have two conditions, two separate conditions that are happening to you. You might be um, distracted and um, angry or distracted and paper cut or something like that. Um, so that is the real basic approach to any particular opposition or conflict. Now, there's a, obviously a lot of different things that are going to happen uh, with that. Now, with regard to faith dice, um, this is where you, if you want to, in that particular challenge, invoke one of your uh, aspects, you choose an aspect, and you have to justify why you are able to use that aspect in that particular situation. If the Demon Master agrees, then you can add a d6 to that, and that gets subtracted to from your um, total faith dice. So everybody starts with three, um, and so you spend that, that one faith die, you can roll it, and uh, add that to your total. <clears throat> So that means that faith dice are a limited resource, and you'll want to try and earn those, and there's a number of ways that you can earn those. So one is by, as I mentioned before, enduring. So in this situation, um, you might uh, be choosing to endure one of your aspects, and so you roll your approach, and you roll your discipline, and you only keep the higher of the two, and because of that, you gain a faith die. Um, whatever the situation is, and you still play out the outcome if you wish. Now, regarding approach and discipline dice, if you roll a 1 on either or both of your approach and discipline dice, you can choose to receive a faith die. If you choose to receive a faith die, the Demon Master also gets a demon die. You know that going in. So you if you get an advantage out of that, so does the demon master. Now, that doesn't mean that the demon master is going to use that demon die against you right then and there. Um, it's more for his his or her pool of, of demon dice, and I'll get into that in a moment. But uh, that faith die that you just earned by rolling one, if you choose to accept it. Uh, you can immediately spend it to re-roll that one, if you wish. Or you can save it for later. Speaking of rolling a one, if you roll a one when you spend a faith die, uh, your faith die is not spent. So you get to keep your faith die. It's still a one, um, but it's not spent. You get to retain it in your pool. Okay, so um, 
enduring, robust uh, approach and discipline, you only keep one. Uh, the higher of the two, you get a faith die. If you roll a one on either your approach or your discipline, then you gain a faith die if you choose, and if you choose to gain that faith die, Demon Master gets a demon die. And then the catch-all for me is if you do something awesome, you get a faith die. But, um, but that's probably not going to be spelled out in the game. Um, the primary, primary thing with faith dice is that it's faith. You're taking a situation on trust that if you are going through something now, you will be rewarded later on. And so you, the whole idea is you're, you're trusting that you're getting going to get through this, and that's a conceptual idea about faith dice. And so use that as a guide as you um, figure out when and where you want to hand those out. Questions about faith dice and um, utilizing them with your character's aspects? Um, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, okay. In the book, it makes a, a point to say that faith dice can only be used before you roll. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's accepting the case where you earned a faith dice f from that roll? Correct. Okay. And uh, you, you mentioned faith dice, you add the, the d6 to the roll, but you don't re-roll the, the whole pool, do you? No. Um, so... <clears throat> That's a fate thing. It, yeah. In the, um, yeah, the way it's supposed to go, so if you roll your approach and you roll your discipline and one of them comes up a one, you can gain a faith die. You don't have to. Um, but if you choose to, then you get that faith die. You can then choose to go ahead and spend that faith die and the and the die that rolled a one, you can re-roll that. Wait, um, that. So you don't, when you spend that faith die, instead of rolling the faith die with the dice you just rolled, you re-roll the one that earned you the faith die? Right. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so you can do that, or you can just take that d6 and put it in your pool and do, right. use it for later. Okay. Uh, um, now, for uh, enduring... Um, you don't spend that faith die when you endure that you gain. Okay? So you roll an approach, you roll a discipline, you only take one, you gain a faith die, you're you're not spending that faith die when you gain it. If you rolled a one when you endured, can you, there, you get that, additional faith dice? That would be a separate instance where then you could... Uh, Gain a faith die again. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So if you're spending the faith die right away, then it's basically just a re-roll of the one. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And once again, if you roll a one on your faith die, it is not spent. If you roll a faith dice, not if you spend it to re-roll another dice, right? Correct, yeah. Correct. Okay. Robin Shadwick, I'm just going to introduce this question here. Uh, is there a possibility for stunts to include drawbacks, such as supernatural weaknesses, to balance out the more powerful stunts? Sorry for asking this boring question again. Um, I... I don't, I'm not sure what an advantage for that would be. Um, I think anytime you want to stunt, you're going to want some kind of advantage out of that. Um, but I suppose you could word a stunt in such a way. Now, I think weaknesses and whatnot, that's going to be in your aspects. Yeah, That's going to be worded in your aspects. So uh, you would accommodate for those weaknesses when you write your aspects. Okay, so other than enduring, there is no place for, say, you being a vampire and you not being able to cross over a, a, a running water or something. Um, There's no narrative 
component to this where it would limit your actions in some way and cause difficulties for you. Can you s rephrase that question or just say that question again? I'm okay. So I, say you're a vampire and you know I don't know. There's some there's something that would limit your actions. You need to get across this river to go mm -hmm. help this child that's about to be attacked by a demon, but you can't cross running water by yourself. You know, right. Somebody would have to help you. Right. And so you're, you're, you're not just stuck there pacing back and forth at the river trying to figure out what to do. You basically could try to cross that river. That, you know, the, it might actually involve a die roll or something. Yeah. And you could do it, correct? Uh, could be, or... Um, or you I just mean, ignore it and it doesn't matter? I mean... I'm so, just trying to figure that out. Yeah. Um, so in that case, uh, I mean, when you're enduring something, you're you're enduring a part of your character that is making life difficult for you. Okay. Um, that sounds like that would be a situation like. Yeah. That. Yeah. So it probably means that um, that Did the opposition the opposition might be still a fifteen for you or something sure. like that. Um, okay. But. Um, so the opposition for me going over that bridge or whatever might be a 15, and that's before I ever would endure it. Right. So it might be smart for me to endure it so that, because I'm probably going to fail anyway, to get a faith dice out of it and go do something else. Right. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Um, and and in, in that case, you might be able to get help in that way. Or Oh, no, I know. I'm just trying to think of how to get my head around it so I can tell yeah. the players. Right. right. You would have to, I mean... Like, by default, I would say in most situations, since the, a, um, like a supernatural creature, like a vampire or a werewolf, like a, werewolf doesn't automatically mean, like, weakness to silver. So if somebody's using, like, a silver weapon, you could justify that as an endure roll, but if you weren't enduring, that person wouldn't get a bonus against you because you're a werewolf, would they? Okay. Yes, if they know about it. Um, so if they know that you're a werewolf, then uh, they will probably know that silver will hurt you, and so okay. then they can tag that um, and use that against you. Maybe that was a bad example. Let's say it's like vampires and counting rice. Okay. Sure. So it sort of depends on your universe. So if somebody's like, I'm a, I know you're a vampire. I'm going to tag your vampire role. I'm going to throw this rice on the ground so and give myself a plus two because you're distracted by all the rice on the ground. Mm -hmm. Another person's like, I'm not that kind of vampire. I'm a twilight vampire who doesn't care about rice and sparkles in the sunlight. So that person just tagged that person's vampirism aspect, and the other person's like, no, I'm not like that. I'm a different kind of thing that's similar to the thing you're thinking of. Right. Um, so as a general rule, you, you don't want to get into a situation of what... I would call it blocking, and that would that's be... That's what I was thinking of, yeah. That, that's blocking. Yeah. Um, and so you're you're building on a, a truth here. And so, uh, you know, there may be a version of vampirism where that's not distracting, but they're tagging it on you. Uh, they get uh, a die to add to their role, um, and um, they think that it is... Uh, uh, distracting thing for you. Turns out, it is mildly distracting uh, to you, and they get a bonus to that. Um, now, uh, in general, that's not an issue for you, but uh, but because they tagged it, maybe that's... I mean, there's a number of ways that you could narrate that. Um, but uh, I would say, you know, when it, it try, and, try and go with the flow of that. Um, yeah, even if you are a twilight sparkly vampire, um, for some reason right now you are fascinated. Maybe you're not, and that's a, yeah, here's another way to interpret that. You're not distracted by counting rice. You're you're offended that he even went there, um, and now you're offended uh, and angry, which is also distracting. And he, you know, gets that bonus on you. Is there room for you to tell people to to maybe? say, does your research actually lead you to believe this or something? Sure. You know, before you can really, you know, 
jump on top of that, you can say, "Wow, that makes a lot. That's very interesting." Did you know when you were at the academy? Did you look up this and what did you learn? And why don't you yeah. run whatever to research to see? And then if that's successful, you can say, "Well, okay, maybe this is relevant." And if it's yeah. not, you can say, "Well, you know." Absolutely. That'd be a really great. I mean, and that's something where you can decide: does that need a role, mm -hmm. or uh, do they just know it? And if you decide, yeah, that does need a role, then I would tag that discipline, um, make them roll that discipline, and see where you go. I'm worried about defining people's characters. Like, if somebody is is fighting a G, uh, a DM. PC or a DMC, and they're mm -hmm. like, "Well, obviously it's a demon. I'm gonna throw holy water. That's not that's not an issue." But if they're like, "If I'm like, oh, you're a vampire. This guy has a stake, and I'm, I don't I feel like defining a player's character's weakness is sort of taking their character away from them. But based on the thing they chose, there's gonna be sort of implications of that. So like, if they're a cipher, and you're like, "Well, this guy has an EMP blast," and they're like. No, I, that's not, my cipher isn't weak to that. That's I don't want to be weak to that. But you're like, well, you're a robot. So the way that you would answer that is, does your cipher have any aspect that says he's immune to that? Okay. If not, then I would say he's probably subject to an EMP blast. Okay. <laughs> you know, once again, uh, if... Uh, your aspects are going to define those situations, you know, define those delineating factors. If you're a special kind of vampire, include that in how you word your aspect or your stunt. Um, be specific. Uh, otherwise, people will take advantage of you. Okay. Right. right. There you go. Um, I think the other thing to point out, uh, as Scott will know, is that um, aspects are kind of the currency of the game, uh, or rather they're, they're really what makes the game super fun and interesting. So the thing to remember is just about everything has aspects. Um, the room has an aspect. The situation can have an aspect. Uh, so not just persons or, um, you know, objects can have aspects. Um, you know, the whole thing, your chapter as a group will have aspects, or can have them if you choose to do that. Um, so, um, the whole life, and then you're going to, when you create advantages and overcome things, and um, you're going to be able to create situational or temporary aspects that you can utilize right away for free, or somebody else can utilize it. Um, so there, there's a lot of different things that you can do. Aspects are going to be all over the place. And so, um, you're going to want to be able to get comfortable with that, um, with utilizing that. So, um, I think then moving on from aspects. So creating an advantage. Um, I'm going to look this up in the book because I always have a little bit of a lot of different stuff here. Ninety-five. So I'm in um, on page ninety-five here, going through uh, and kind of talking about oppositions and creating advantages and stuff. So creating an advantage is kind of a fun action. So again, there's four actions: you can attack, defend, overcome, uh, or create an advantage. And so when you're creating an advantage, you're, you're basically trying to create, uh, you know, uh, some kind of help for yourself or somebody else to succeed in the future, either in the immediate future or um, or a little bit later. And what you're doing is you can create essentially a new situation aspect when you do that. You can generate an aspect right then and there. You can discover one that already exists and utilize it, um, or you can take advantage of uh, existing aspects that you already know about uh, for free. And so, 
Um, if you succeed, you get to uh, discover that aspect, or uh, you may. Um, so, if you do that, then you or an ally can invoke that for free. So there, uh, it's one of the things that's kind of nice. Uh, I might suggest if you're going to run the game, is have a stack of post-it notes or an index card or something, or index cards, and write that aspect on there. And then uh, we like to go ahead and set that on the table and put a die on it. Or if you want to use a token or whatever you want to do, just to signify that there's something there that people can utilize. Uh, and if it's one that you can use for free, somebody else can spend a faith die to also utilize that. Um, so it's not just yourself. Um, but there may be situations where you generate it and you or an ally can, can create it. Um, I didn't talk about succeeding with style, uh, and that is when you, um, when you do those uh, advanced, or, um, opposed roles, either with an opposition or with, um, with uh, attack and defend or something like that. Um, if you succeed by five hits or more, five points or more, then you succeed with style. And that just means something more extra awesome happens. And with creating an advantage, um, when you create a situation aspect, you can actually create two free invokes on that. Um, it's about the only time in the game where you can do that. Um, and Can those be used concurrently? There's only one situation that you can do that concurrently, and that is... Um, when you are creating a new aspect or discovering an existing one. Um, usually you can't evoke the same aspect twice, but when you are creating an aspect or discovering an existing one, uh, which is essentially like, oh, that exists there, um, then if you succeed with style, there can be two of those there, and you can utilize both. You can spend them both at the same time if you want. Good question. No other time in the game can you do that. Um, so if you're trying to take advantage of an aspect you already know about and you succeed with style, you can place two dice on there um, as uh, free invokes, but you and then maybe somebody else can utilize that. Um, it's not, you can't spend them both at the same time for one person. Um. Um, is discovering an that existing aspect the same thing as tagging an aspect to get a bonus? It's different, right? Um, it's included. Uh, so when you're tagging, uh, what I mean by that is um, either, again, one of three things are happening, or one of really two things. Either a situate or an aspect exists but you don't know it exists and you discover that it does mm -hmm. uh, if you discover that it does exist you can tag it um, if you know it exists you can tag it if you create one <coughs> then you can tag it so does that make sense yeah but for example like let's say you have an uh, GMPC who's uh, or a GMC who's a like mindless zombie mm -hmm. who has the mindless zombie aspect on it. Right. And they, they know all the zombies are mindless zombies, presumably with that aspect on it. And they're like, well, we're going to outsmart the mindless zombie, and we're just going to do whatever. We're going to tag that to get a plus two on our roll. It, well, there's not a plus two. It's a it's an extra die. I'm sorry. Did, they were going to tag that to use a faith die to... Yeah. To, right. Okay, that's what I meant. Sorry. Right. Right. Uh, they didn't discover that or create it, but they knew it was there right. based on the character. Right. So that wouldn't fall into this. That would just be normally tagging. Well, aspects, right? it's um, yeah. So this would fall under the create an advantage situation. Um, I mean, you can you can try and attack and get an extra bonus on that because you know that they're mindless and mm -hmm. and. You know, do that way. But if you're trying to create an advantage and right. utilizing something, you're basically calling out that they are mindless zombies, and maybe you're talking out a strategy on how to outsmart them. That means that if you succeed, 
uh, that uh, there there's a, a D6 sitting there waiting for somebody that's free. So you have could, to spend a faith die to utilize it. Um, okay. Or if you succeed with style, there's two of them there. And once they're used up, they're gone. So they would be discovering the mindless zombie thing. They would be make, making an aspect that's involved. So like plan to kill the mindless zombies could be an aspect. Sure. Okay. And then yeah. they would be able to tag that to get an additional bonus against said mindless zombies. It's kind of a boost. Right. Kind okay. of was talking about. Yeah. Um, but, you, but you could create an advantage of say, if I'm covered in gore, I'm not yeah. noticeable to them. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. That makes totally. sense. All right. So when you're There's... determining the opposition for these particular roles of creating advantages. Basically, are you wanting them to outline what kind of advantage it is they're wanting so that you know how much of an opposition you should be presenting for that creation of that advantage? Or how yeah, are, I, mean, I guess I'm uh, confused as to role to determine what, whether or not they succeed at creating the advantages. So Does that make you always sense? want them to talk out about you know what they are trying to do. It's like okay, I'm going to use the create advantage um, action. Okay, great. What are you going to do? Tell me about like what are you doing in this situation that's going to create an advantage and you know and get them to talk up to you about what they're thinking. Um, and based on that, then you can set an opposition or um, the. Uh, you know, if there is an opposing party, then maybe they'll want to defend against that, and that will be the target. Okay. I always like to get specifics. Okay, sure. you're going to use this action. Tell me about that. What's What are you doing? Yeah, so I, I'm just, in my own fate experience, typically you often try to set the create advantage role difficulties as not that high because you want people to use it. Mm -hmm. Is that the case here where a lot of times if they're not too complicated it would be about a five or something? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So if you if you wanted to like turn off the lights to make the lights out aspect, then that'd probably just be an opposition five, right? Like right. you wouldn't be like okay. That yeah. makes sense. Uh, and it may only be a five because you happen to be across the room at the time. <laughs> you know? If you're standing right next to it, you don't even have to roll. Okay. Oh, okay. That makes sense. But if they so don't you can roll, create an advantage without rolling. No, but you can turn off the lights. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good questions. I'm probably not going to cover them all. Um, but, um, you know, there are, there are other things that, that you can do, like um, overcoming. So overcoming is any, any kind of challenge that is not an attack um, that you're trying to overcome. There that, so it could be an obstruction. It could be climbing. It could be jumping. It could be gambling. Um, it could be a, a debate, you know, um, any of these kinds of things uh, would be an overcome action. A room full of mooks? Uh, if violence is not involved, then maybe. Um, but if you're going to attack them, attack mooks, or mooks are attacking you, then... Um, so if you as a DM, you want to move things along and get to the next room where the more exciting stuff has happened. Mm -hmm. For your big badass werewolf, couldn't you just tell him it's an overcome? Sure. Yeah. Um, and maybe they they do that with uh, you know I've I've known some DMs uh, where they just say <laughs> you know what uh, you're too smart for them, and you know you. You move right through it; it's no problem, and you just you know keep it along. If you want to have them make a roll, great. Um, just be prepared for what happens if they fail. And what does that mean? 
So, um, so attack. Well, the is, next thing with overcome is you still can succeed, right? At a cost. Yeah, that's true. It's very true. Um, and then if you succeed with style, then maybe there isn't a cost. <clears throat> Good questions. I'm looking up over here because I have the book up over here. So, um, okay. And then attack and defend, I think, is kind of self-explanatory. Um, I don't know if I need to really go much into those particular actions there, kind of with your... Can you use defend, like, as sort of the block action? Like, you want to stop somebody from going through the door? Yep. Can you, like, establish a defense before they even get to attack it? Um, it sounds like you might... In that particular instance, if you know it's going to come, you would create an advantage. Okay. Um, that, that could be an action. Or if it's just like, you know, you're all going to defend, um, then you're essentially creating something that somebody else is going to have to overcome. So if you're, like, barricading a door... Right. I, I would normally think that would be, like, a defensive roll against whatever who's trying to break into the door would just roll against that. Could be. I mean, I I would I would say it just depends on how much time you have. Uh, uh, if you have some time to prepare, if you're going to create, you know, a barricade and you have a few minutes to assemble stuff, you might I might say that's a created advantage action. Um, you okay. know, but yeah. uh, then you follow that up with your defend to to oppose the the obstacle. Right. Okay. I yeah. guess what he's asking though is something that you know. It, it's so so. Say you create this obstacle, right? This this the, you create this advantage to create a, a uh, barrier, mm -hmm. but you have to run away. Right, right. That's so exactly. That creates what I'm a passive obstacle to the mm -hmm. open. Yep. And how do you determine how good it is? Well, you might decide that uh, if they succeed in creating an advantage, then it is an opposition ten. Uh, if they succeed with style, it's a fifteen. So you just bump the opposition up, you know. yeah. Yeah, Because um, a ten is kind of your challenge, your normal challenge. Um, a five is something easy. A five is like, you know, they could step over it, but it's in their way. Um, which might be a challenge ten for shambling zombies. You never. Know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Good questions about about those. Um, all right, so there's a whole bunch of, of these different kinds of actions where you can attack and you can defend, you can overcome this blocked door or overcome the goons that are blocking that door somehow. And over and that overcome might be a a persuasion role. It could be. Um, on an intimidation roll, um, it could be a sneaky, they don't know I'm there roll, you know, that's an overcome. Uh, so just because there are, there is somebody else in the room that you are trying to overcome doesn't mean it has to be an attack. Um, <clears throat> if they're aware of it, then there will probably be a defend roll on their part. If they're not aware of it, then it might just be a static opposition roll. Up to you. Now we're going to get into demon dice. Demon dice are probably my favorite invention of the game. Um, and demon dice, so faith dice are representative of the yeah, idea of trust, having faith. Uh, you are going through hardship knowing that you are being taken care of and that you will gain a boost from that. Demon dice are the opposite. They're, they're uh, temptation. They're the quick win right now uh, for the trade-off of something worse, either immediate or down the road. So um, in front of every single player, it, uh, is three demon dice, uh, is d6s. And this is a constantly refreshing set of three die six. Uh, it's unlimited. 
but they can only use up to three on a, any one particular rule. And once they utilize those, they are spent, and by spent, they are given to the demon master and are added to his or her pool of demon dice. Now, the demon master starts with a number of demon dice equal to the number of players. And demon dice uh, cannot be earned like faith dice can. They can only be awarded to the demon master by player choice. Um, and then you can, as the DM, you can utilize those demon dice to invoke aspects, um, create advantages, uh, uh, or so on. Um, where does it say only three demon dice? Um, let's see, I'm on the page here. Does it say that? Um, demon dice or temptation, if a player rolls... Da -da -da. She can take one, two, or three demon dice from the pile and roll them, adding to the result to her total. There are no cost to do this. So I'm on page 102. You're welcome. Um, once they are used, they are handed to the DM. Uh, they don't have immediate effect other than to the total of the roll, per se. Uh, the other possibility is that if you decide, um, and there's a really good reason why you would do this, uh, you would spend demon dice to roll on the badness table um, or the costs table. Uh, there's two different kind of tables there. And you can generate your own badness table uh, too. We give you a, in the book we give you kind of a format to do that. Um, most of the time you might want to roll on the badness table when a player rolls a one on a demon die. Rolling one on anything else is there's a reward, but rolling one on demon dice is bad because it's already a temptation, and and so um, that's where you might uh, decide that um, you roll on the badness table or you can roll on the cost table to just create something that's a little bit more uh, problematic for the players. Once you re roll that, you can decide if it's immediate or uh, if you're going to work it in a little bit later. It's up to you. But for the most part, um, demon dice are just, a, they're always rolled after the player has rolled all their dice and they know the result and they're just coming up short. So again, it's a temptation. They don't have to spend all three. They can spend one at a time, but up to three uh, on any given roll. So um, there are minor costs and serious costs, and that would um, kind of determine which table you might want to take a look at. There's a general, generic, everyday badness table. And the way you roll on that is, again, you'll take um, your number of demon dice, one, two, five, however many demon dice you're going to roll. You're going to roll them together, and you're going to check the result on your badness table. Um, so you're rolling d6s on that one and adding them together. Once you do roll those, though, those are spent. So you those come out of your pile, um, even if you're rolling on the, uh, the badness table. Costs are always going to be rolled with a D100, um, and there are longer effects. Uh, page 103 is going to be uh, a little bit more on that. I don't recall exactly how they decided to choose, but essentially, uh, you know, if they roll ones, uh, on multiple demon dice, that's going to tell you, you know, how you know, worse things are going to be. Uh, you just said costs were going to be rolled with a D percent, but I don't. Where is that chart in the? Is there a chart in the book? Ben? There is. Uh, I'm trying to see here. Because I know there's the list where it's for like every one they get, there's a minor, or serious cost. Yeah, I'm trying to. Let's see here. So. That must be later on in the Game Master section that we added that table. 
I'll tell you the story behind that uh, momentarily. Uh, yeah. Cost, there it is. Um, using demon dice. Yeah, page 103 is the. 185 is what I'm, or 186 is what I'm looking at here. Badness tables. You can use a generic one on page 104. Um, badness stri uh, tables are already structured on page 185. They give you a, a oh. kind of a, a set there of how to create your own. Um, and then what did they decide? So if you have no idea, if you have no idea what kind of cost to inflict on the demon hunters, we provided you with a big table. Roll on this just to let things go. Uh, yeah. So um, it's kind of a hail mary kind of just to give you ideas. Um, so that's what the cost table is. What ended up happening is that I created this cost table as sort of an obstacles, um, and when you generate an adventure. In the previous old version that I was doing, uh, you would roll a d6, and that's how many of those you'd roll, uh, and you'd somehow track, figure out how to work them into your adventure. So they're just stumbling blocks, things that go bad. Um, you know, uh, normal uh, a normal assisting the PC is really working for the big bad guy, uh, in other words, or um, the chapter's ride is booted, towed, stolen, or searched. Um, just inconveniences and things like that. Um, so there's no real hard and fast thing. It's just a tool there if you want to utilize it and spice up your so situation great. But um, how, does the, how does the badness table work with the costs table? They don't. There are two separate things. The, the the costs are just inconveniences. So if uh, and they're more specific. So if you roll something on the badness table and you're like, okay, um, uh, oh, the cost some kind of, okay. yeah, some kind of minor thing happens that's a problem for the characters. Then you're like, well, I, I don't have any ideas. I'm going to roll on the cost table and see if I can work that in. Or you don't even have to roll. You can just look at look on the cost table and see if something works for you. Okay. It's just an idea generator. Mm -hmm. All right. So, don't want to get too involved. I've I, I've been labeled a table crazy. I like to create a lot of tables, um, uh, which is evident in the book. But um, they're just if you don't need them, you don't need them. You don't need to use it. But the badness table I thought was really fun. So <clears throat> anyway, demon dice uh, spend up to three for players. Um, I. I made a rule when I was playing Silent Jim uh, on the Hangouts that ev I just decided that every single roll that he made, he would spend all three demon dice, and just made things very interesting. He was able to do very epic, amazing stuff, but he died horribly at the end of the uh, session. So, is the DM limited by how many uh, demon dice they can use? Not for badness table, like if they want to tag as tag conditions or something, is it the same limit as the players? Yeah. Um, so you can only so again you can only tag one aspect at a okay. t um, for one die, um, but you can tag multiple aspects and get multiple die rolls off of that. So. Um, okay. <clears throat> um, yeah. So. So if you have three aspects that are that that are part of your character that you know that will help you in this particular situation, then you can uh, you can utilize those. But you're spending three aspects essentially or three faith dice to do that. Okay. So there's always a <laughs> that's my dog. Hey, sweetie. <laughs> that's my doggy. We're getting ready for Gen Con in the back here. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is uh, Demon Dice. Um, I think at this stage it's a good time to start working on creating Demon Master characters. Um, before I do that, I just want to open up to any questions.
Uh, oh yeah, I can go back to the Q and A. Are there any Q and A questions? Nope. Okay. So those of you who are tuning in, if you have questions, and um, you can actually type those in uh, to the Q and A daily there on the Hangout, and I will see those and answer those as I can. So. <clears throat> All right, next section is we're going to talk about creating Demon Master characters. And uh, Demon Master characters uh, are essentially non-player characters, NPCs, and there are uh, essentially two versions uh, that you can uh, use to create those, and those are regular uh, DMCs, and then there are minions. And then there's a version of minions that are essentially mobs, um, which is just a modified minion here. So let me. Uh, just, uh, find the page there. I think it was. One eighty. It's one eighty eight. 188, thank you. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> I'm in the process of creating uh, DMC cards, a um, uh, blank tool that you can fill out for each one. Uh, when I was playing the James Bond role-playing game from Victory Games, uh, I really liked that they had these little a format that you could print on an index card, and I had a little box of NPCs that I could just pull out, including like groups of, like if I had a certain group of soldiers that had a particular, you know, speciality or whatever, I could create a card for that. So, um, so my design is to kind of do something similar, and then maybe we'll work in an electronic tool for that as well, um, but. Uh, DMCs don't, so normal statted out DMCs don't have the normal um, disciplines that we do, uh, that players do. They will, you'll basically have something that they are, um, uh, if you really want to flesh them out, you'll, each one will end up basically having five uh, disciplines. And and be, you know, thinking of something that the DMC does really, really well, uh, that's basically their job description, give them a D10 in that. We're just talking about the, the discipline side of things. Yeah. The approach is their exact same thing. Um, so D10, 2 die 8, 2 die 6, and a D4 assign, as you will. Um, but the, uh, for the discipline side of things, then um, we're going to replace that with a D10 and what is their job description? What is it the thing that they do well? Um, think of two things that they do well enough um, that they can be kind of known for. Give them a D8 in those. And then think of uh, two things that they suck at and give them D4s in that. Uh, so no D6s uh, on those. And then um, basically their default uh, any other task that they can do uh, is a D6 for them. So D6 is their generic die. Um, so we're utilizing the D4s to represent the day second of it. And then from there, create uh, you know two to three aspects and a stunt uh, for that DMC, and you're good to go. So those are for your named NPCs that are going to have abilities. Um, and I think, once again, if they're a particularly badass, um, you might want to crank one approach up to a D12. Uh, you could do something similar with the, the discipline. If they're D10, you know, if you want to make them particularly hard, you could crank it up. But, you know. Could you give an example of a DMC like discipline? Like, would killing hunters with my giant sword be a discipline for a DMC? Um, probably more like, um, you know, like undead warrior. Yeah, 
Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's around a sword. <laughs> right. Um, ninja vampire. Okay. Um, anarchist werewolf. All right. So. The, the, uh, okay. I'm gonna have trouble with that. <laughs> Read the book on writing aspects. You'll be all right. Okay. Um, because it it. For the discipline, again, think it's it's about what they're good at. So, let's let's think about a character. Uh, what it throw out a very well known villain that might fit in the Demon Hunter's world. Dracula. Okay, so let's make Dracula. So, um, Dracula's number one thing. Uh, discipline would be aristocratic vampire. Yeah, aristocratic vampire, or or maybe just master vampire. But uh, would that be an aspect, or would that be a discipline? So discipline. What we're talking about is what is his job description? Okay. What is he? Um, and for DMCs, know, it could probably be both, right? It can be. Yeah. Um, just to keep it simple. Sure. Might as well. Uh, you know, and so uh, if you want to do that, you could do aristoc aristocratic vampire, uh, or you just might go master vampire, um, and that's his D10. And then two things that he does well enough. Well, he's an aristocrat, so aristocrat might be a D8. Um, so he, that kind of suggests some things that he's good at. Um, what's another thing? Uh, Sneaky. Sneaks around. He's well, that's an uh, approach. Yeah. Uh, seductive? Seductive, yeah. I think we could probably utilize an aspect for that. I'm thinking more of, again, what is it that he does um, that isn't necessarily a vampire, and that isn't necessarily a um, tied to social stuff like being an aristocrat. So I'll throw it out to you. Uh, maybe in some versions of Dracula, he was either um, a mystic uh, or a mad scientist. So either of those could be, um, you know, he's he's a practitioner of the arts. Um, so maybe he's got a D8 in that. And then two things he really sucks at. Subtlety? What was that? What, what did maybe you say? something like subtlety? Like he's not able to keep... <laughs> subtlety? He's not able okay. to keep things um, low-key. Like he's always flashy and... Got it. Okay. Like, it's pretty clear he's done something. Like, he needs, like, a calling card or something. Right, right. Okay, yeah. So, he sucks at being subtle. <laughs> and uh, maybe he sucks at um, uh, appealing to the working class. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know. Uh so, I mean, the whole idea is like, you know, uh, you know is he good at spotting? Well, maybe he is. If it, again, thinking, so the discipline section is, you know, you want to be thinking about that these are actions or knowledge that this character can do or know. Um, so uh, pop culture might be a thing that he sucks at. Modern technology. Yeah. iPhones are his bane. <laughs> okay. So, and then you generate aspects per normal. You give him a stunt. You're good to go. Questions about that? No. Nope. Good. Okay. Then... Uh, for your nameless NPCs uh, and uh, mooks and whatnot, uh, we go to come on. Oh, yeah.
Wow, how the heck did I get all the way over there? Um, so instead of doing everything that we just did, you're just going to focus on the four actions. Uh, attack, defend, uh, create an advantage, and overcome. And why do I keep going from 188 to 175? That does not make any sense at all. <clears throat> Alright, so minions have uh, attack, defend, overcome, create an advantage, and then you just have a die array of 2 die 8, 4 die 6, and 2 die 4, and you distribute them among those four actions. So each action gets two dice, and just assign from there, and then uh, maybe give them uh, an aspect or two, and then, um, you know, and I guess the other thing that we didn't talk about are conditions, and so can, you know, Minions typically have the same amount, you know, a tough minion would have the same amount of conditions that a player character would. Uh, three mild, two moderate, one severe. A good minion would be two mild and one moderate. And just an easy average, you know, minion would be one mild condition. So they could really take one hit and they're gone. Um, kind of thing. So, very similar thing with the. Uh, with the DMCs previous, you could do something very similar. Uh, to make them tougher, give them more uh, conditions that they can endure. Uh, not endure, but uh, take. Give them more boxes. Uh, so mobs of minions, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to add mild conditions or mild and moderate conditions. So um, a big mob, you're going to take, you're going to decide what kind of minion they are, tough, good, or average. And then, if they're a big mob, add five mild conditions to it. If they're an average, four mild conditions. If they're small, three mild conditions. There you go. Um, question about the dice array for minions. Yeah. It, it specifically gives two examples of you can pair an eight with a four or two sixes together. Does that mean mm -hmm. you can't you can't put two eights together, or um, let me see here. You can pair up an 8 with a 4 or per 2d6. The point is to make sure the 8 dice are all assigned to those 4 stats and each stat have as 2 dice assigned to it. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I read that as it doesn't really matter. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you, you have 2 8s, 4 6s, and 2 4s and assign as you will. Just pair them up. Okay. Um, I, I, maybe I missed this also, but like when you were talking about attacking and such, if you inflict, if you get a condition or mm -hmm. you put a condition on somebody else, does that come with a free tag? Um, typically, yeah, um, it does. And it's one tag, no matter what the the severity is. Uh, unless it was um, a success with style, then there may be two tags. Um, just okay. depends on what it was. But typically, I mean, if it's on the player character, then it's just going to be one tag. So um, a serious tag is, or a severe tag isn't a persistent thing you can tag for free? Um, like, if, like in Fate, a uh, severe tag is always right. taggable? I would say... Maybe not free. I don't know that that's even spelled out. That's a good question. Yeah, if, um, if it was fate, you would say no, but it could passively add to difficulties and cause problems with the person just because, you know, if they are missing a leg, it's going to be difficult to walk up the stairs. Right, right. And they're going to be in pain and yeah, um, that sort of thing. And, yeah, I mean, I again, it's a narrative situation, <laughs> and so I would make sure that that uh, guides your answer, but... Uh, I would say if it makes sense that anybody who sees that and they're going to take advantage of you have your leg bitten off uh, and they're going to kick you in your stump uh, if they can, um, then yeah, they probably get a free invoke on that. But uh, but you know if they don't have the ability to, maybe they have to spend a demon die to 
take advantage of that. At the very least, they know about it. And also, there's the converse that if you have a major condition, it's going to be pretty obvious you have it, so it'll be easy to create advantages that will allow you to get free invokes on it. Or yeah, free tags or absolutely. Free absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> That's exactly right. And, um, and so, to get rid of your conditions, you have to make an overcome role. I think. Is that overcome or create an advantage? It was... It might be created an advantage, actually. That was its own thing. It was like... Yeah, I'm looking at that right now. Uh, Wasn't it, like, refreshing? Or... No, well, you used one of the four actions, and I think it was create an advantage. I could be... Comp or actually, overcome. it's its own thing. It says recovery action. Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. Yeah, it has, it has its own name. Now, you may be... It may actually be some other kind of role, but it seems to have its own name. Let's take a look. Uh, recovery 116. That's right after the uh, conceding. Oh, yeah, recovery from conditions. Okay. Uh, approach plus discipline. They're a variation of the overcome action because you use a static opposition 5, 10, 15. Okay. Okay, so it's essentially a, an overcome role then um, with a static opposition. Um, so, and it's, that, that makes a lot of sense to me because a 5 is going to be a mild, a 10 is going to be a moderate, and a 15 is going to be severe. Um, and if you succeed, then um, then you're on the road to recovery, in other words. And so for a mild condition, at the end of the uh, conflict or the scene, you should be able to recover that condition. Um, for a moderate, it might be the end of the session. Uh, for a severe, it may take you several sessions uh, or reach a major milestone. Uh, to to clear that condition. Additionally, this was brought up because of the awesome um, fate guys uh, who know this really well. A uh, question about uh, a severe condition or something like that. Would it create a permanent aspect uh, that lives on, or even a, just a long standing aspect on your character? And I would uh, when you reach a milestone, that's something that I would strongly have your characters consider, is is this a new defining thing about your character, um, and are you going to want to incorporate that as a new aspect? Um, certainly, the condition remains, it's an aspect on you until it goes away. Okay, so I, I've got one other question. So you have this place where you're going to have multiple possible mild and moderate conditions? And so it says if you succeed with style, you can clear a mild or moderate condition right now. So that means one, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, if you have several of them and you succeed like on milds, mm -hmm. and you says you can clear them immediately, can you clear all of them immediately or can you clear one at a time? Um, what does it say? If you succeed with style, you can clear they, a... It's plural. Okay, I, now I see it. Yeah. If you succeed with style, you can clear a mild or moderate condition right now and get to the rest later. Each type takes a certain length of time. I just described that. Yeah. Okay. Um, if, okay, so it mentions during downtime, you can assume they've already taken the recovery action but there's right. different benefits from succeeding and succeeding with style when using the recovery action. So uh, when you're assuming they're doing it during downtime, what was their success on that role? Uh, I would always just assume that it's a normal success and not a success with style. If they want a success with style, they have to roll. Okay. Okay. Unless you just want to reward them that. That's the other option, too. Is it possible to have other people 
help or create advantages to help you with the recovery role? Yeah, I would say absolutely. I don't think that that is actually spelled out in the book, but uh, it's, it's inferred that if you're creating an advantage, you could apply that to a lot of different things, um, including a recovery role. Good question. Okay. I think that's the nuts and bolts of the mechanics I'm going to cover in this sort of workshop uh, at that point. Um, and I think the next uh, section that we're going to talk about is generating an adventure. Uh, and this is the section that I had the most work in. Um, and so I feel good that I've been able to talk relatively competently about stuff I didn't develop. Um, <laughs> that may be arguable. Um, but, uh, but this next section I can definitely uh, talk about with expertise. Um, so, and that is designing an adventure, uh, designing a mission. And uh, that's how this entire role-playing game this version of it uh, got started is um, I was asked to create a uh, role-playing mission for uh, ZoeCon, the very first ZoeCon we ever did, and I went to work and couldn't figure out how to tell a freaking demon hunter story, uh, <laughs> and here I am, one of the co-creators of the world or whatever, and I couldn't figure it out. Um, so I had Jimmy, who was on earlier, and he, uh, I just had him roll, write me a short story, and then I would just take that short story and break it out into, you know, encounters and playable situations and kind of create some challenges and stuff and go from there. And as I was breaking it out, um, it got, essentially, it, it um, rang a bell with me. I, I saw a structure that I uh, had used before. And that was from the James Bond role-playing game. There was an adventure generation section um, supplement that they called uh, For Your Information. And it was a series of tables, so that's what a lot of this is modeled after. And then I discovered the front system from Apocalypse World and Powered by the Apocalypse, and so I stole a bunch of that, too. Um, okay, so um, in your books at the very end, I have already discovered a, um, a couple of formatting or uh, content issues with it, but uh, that's okay. Uh, we're going to be on page 194, 195, 196, 197. That's the, uh, so the profile. Um, I'm going to have this up on the website that I uh, posted um, or you can download this as well separately from the book. And you can, if you just like to print it out and write on it, uh, there's a version of that, just like a character sheet. Or if you want a fillable one, I just made up one of those as well. Um, but <clears throat> essentially what you're going to start with, and then um, there is... Let's see, where is that? I'm going to start with Five Minutes to Mayhem. There we go. Page 119. Uh, or rather, 121. <clears throat> and there's kind of a, an, a, a process that you can use. Uh, and what I developed is really meant to be able to be a tool for GMs and DMs of varying skill levels and comfort levels and creativity. So this is this whole thing can be utilized in its entirety or just little bits um, depending on what you need to create a story that you're comfortable with. And so the process, uh, once again, I developed this for myself, and the process that I found um, stems from not just random table generation, but also has grounds in writing uh, scripts for television and movies. 
in a typical uh, four to five act structure, uh, and then define and using some narrative techniques uh, and writing techniques to help flush out some of your characters and motivations and that sort of thing. And so, what we kind of start with is the teaser section, and I'm going to try and pull that up. I think I have that here somewhere. There we are. <clears throat> and for those of you playing at home, uh, we're going to want to have the tables up. Um, and those start on page 128 and following, 129. And for you Dungeon Masters here in the, uh, in the session, I would encourage you to pull out some percentiles and uh, some D6s and whatnot will help kind of build a mission together uh, to see how this works. And I'll be asking for um, for values from those tables. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share this mission record sheet. This uh, mission profile, I should say. We're going to start with the teaser section. I'm going to skip the bad piece and I'm going to skip the mission agenda. These are much larger things that we can get to a little later. And for those who are running the, the Gen Con uh, campaign, I'm going to have all this filled out and everything and, and uh, typed up a little bit more for what we're actually going to run. Uh, but we'll go ahead and demonstrate this to see how it works. So um, the teaser. The teaser can be used as the skeleton for your entire mission. I find that it's very helpful um, in that it might be the scene that you just throw your players into, kind of like a pre-title uh, sequence, like in a James Bond movie or an episode of Supernatural, um, something bad happens to somebody, uh, gets you right into the action and, and gets you going. Um, but as you generate this, you may decide to pull elements out of this and just actually make it part of the larger adventure. It's really, for me, it's a good place to start. So, um, starting on page 128, if uh, one of you could roll me a mission objective on the table there. It's a D100 roll. 93. 93. Kidnap. All right. <clears throat> so, we have a kidnapping. And, of course, uh, we have to find out who our featured creature is going to be. So let's uh, roll there on the next page. 23. Mad Scientist. Mad Scientist. Fantastic. All right. So we have a Mad Scientist. <clears throat> the, uh, so the way this reads right now is... Um, Likely, the mad we may have to kidnap the mad scientist as the players, um, or as we flesh this out, we may decide the mad scientist kidnapped somebody. So in this case, let's find out who that was, uh, just one way or the other. That's on the normals table. We got a D one hundred roll. Thirty. 30. That's going to be a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> so very, very interesting. Okay. Maybe we got to get somebody out of the lab. Could be. Yeah. Well, now, uh, now things are kind of shaping up kind of very interesting. Let's, uh, let's move on to page... Uh, let's see here. Where are we? Um, oops. I have too many screens open here. Um, so on, page, we're looking on building type here, page 136. Someone roll that for me. At locations? Uh, no, this is building type on 136. Oh, I see. This I got 75 film studio. <laughs> film studio. All right. Um, 
Now we're kind of getting into the optional role category, but let's go ahead and roll on a location type. And that is at the top of page 134. It's just a D10 roll, 1 die 10. Two. Oh, sorry. Uh, slums. Three. Slums. Okay. That may not really help, but maybe uh, the the film studio is a is a set of the slums of somehow. Uh, maybe that's what they're doing. And finally, on the location, um, this is where you might rule on the location table on page one thirty four, uh, or you may decide to just keep it U S specific and we'll roll on the state uh, table. But let's give you a D one hundred roll. Scott? 35. 35. 35. So um, that's Israel <laughs> on the locations table. Or Alaska. Or Alaska on the states table. All right. I don't know too many slums in Alaska. Uh, maybe. Uh, but definitely Israel is kind of interesting. Mad scientist, scientist kidnapping in Israel, student, uh, some sort of films. So <clears throat> right now, uh, I'd like to open it up to you, DMs, um, and let's brainstorm a little bit about what potentials you see for this right now. What are, are ideas coming to you? Somebody is recording a film where a mad scientist is kidnapping another scientist and they're shooting in Israel. Okay, but why is that interesting to the demon hunters? Because mm. it's an evil film studio. Uh, maybe a mad scientist is attempting to brainwash a very popular normal scientist who has a TV show to influence kids. <laughs> Okay, yeah, could be. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I that's, like kind that of, that's kind of good. Um, okay, so this gives us an, an idea of something that we can use. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and move this to maybe a two page. I think if I can do this, a uh, two page. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> All right. So from here, I like to skip the briefing section and come right down to the enemy. And, and from here, what you can decide is, for, for some DMs, this is enough. In the Ooh. teaser section, uh, what we rolled is enough for, for some DMs to go, okay, grab your dice, let's start play. You want the um, but for DMs like me, I need a little bit more help. And so uh, in this section, I'm going to look at uh, the enemy, and we're going to decide if the mad scientist is a good featured creature, if we want to keep that, or if we want to re-roll it. Um, I like mad scientist as our primary enemy. It's kind of cool. Um, and that there's a scientist involved there in the teaser. Uh, someone just, for the heck of it, roll me a featured creature. I just, just kind of want to see what we see. What page is that? Uh, 129. <laughs> um, I got ghost... Base or poltergeist. Okay. With a 59. 59, all right. Okay, so yeah. Uh, ghost, wraith, uh, poltergeist. Um, okay. This is kind of where I start playing with some different ideas. I haven't really decided if I like the ghost, wraith, pulse, and ghost. Um, there might be some interesting stuff there. And the uh, scientists could be like manipulating dead spirits yeah, or something. Right, right, totally. Um, because that's mad. Yeah. 
One thing that's going to tell us a few things here is the Grand Evil Plan. The Grand Evil Plan is another D100 roll. It's on page 130. I got a 91, create the worst society. All right. <clears throat> create the worst society. <clears throat> now, the Grand Evil Plan, I have stolen right out of um, a list of major... Uh, movie plots or book plots, basically. And there's like a top number of them, and these are the, the primary ones that villains are trying to do. And so I didn't make it up. Uh, totally stole it. And so Create the Worst Society is one of the major ones that came up. And so now we have to ask a question. What's this person doing? Um, what is their vision of the worst society, and how do ghosts play into it. Um, this is kind of starting to feel a little bit like Ghostbusters. Yeah, or Poltergeist. I was yeah. thinking Poltergeist. And yeah, yeah. And, and, I'm and thinking evil. spirits going through the TVs to all the little... There you go. Exactly. ...or something would be actually... I like That's it. That's I great. Like okay. So there's a... Yeah, okay. So, and this mad... Mad scientist. I'm kind of feeling that that's that's probably the major person who's behind all this. Um, if they were to kill, why would they kill? And that is going to be on the kill motive. I, I always wonder if uh, motives for murder. Motives for murder. It's yeah. changed on every chart. I know. Different name. We're going to have to fix that. Um, yeah. So motives for murder. D12, roll. Yeah. Obsession, frustration, or hate. Okay. Number seven. Well, that seems like a pretty good reason to create the worst society. Um, this is what's driving the mad scientist. Uh, they're obsessed or frustrated about something, and they want to to, to do this. Um, all right. Next, uh, let's just go ahead and roll one more victim. Um, so this is going to be on the normal table. Fifty nine. That's a nurse. It's always a nurse. All right. <clears throat> okay. So I mean, I'm almost envisioning like a hospital hospital full of like comatose children or something. <laughs> well, that's a little dark. <laughs> that's all. Awesome. Like that. No, that's great. That's where yeah. I usually go. <laughs> yeah. No, that's awesome. And like, so that's. That's terrific. Okay, so um, so we have this, yeah, so a nurse is going to get it during this, and, and there's going to be this uh, mad scientist. Um, and actually, uh, this reminds me of one of the books of the Dresden Files, um, actually, where they utilize ghosts and twist them and kind of make them a, a weapon. Um, that was kind of interesting. So the next few boxes here, the traumatic event, what it fears, what it loves, and what it hates, um, these are literary uh, tools that you can use when you're talking about your mad scientist or your, your primary enemy. And what you want to think about, there's no table for these. These are just things that, for you to brainstorm and think about. What is, what is a traumatic event? What is the, a thing that set our enemy on this path. They lose somebody that was close to them, or they picked on as a child. Um, did they lose everything in the economic downturn? Um, 
some something happened to them that set them on the path to decide that they were going to do bad things. And nothing specifically comes to mind. Uh, that's okay. Serious new illness that causes children to go into comas, and they lost their child. Okay. Yeah. Death of a child is always the the go-to. The child. Well, the child's still alive. That's how he's going to put him to the TV. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Right. All right. So, um, uh, child. Um, Victim of a mystery illness resulting in this. coma. Loss of a child doesn't necessarily mean. Um, Coma um, due to incompetent doctors. Oh yeah, all doctors are incompetent, uh, or something. And so uh, he's going to show them all, and um, he's going to create the worst society by. Uh, everybody gets to suffer the way he suffered. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's got to pay. Um, so everybody's going to lose somebody. Maybe that's it. So, so he's going to utilize these the spirits in the TV. We're going to throw in a little bit of um, uh, what was that? The ring uh, into this, and we're going to have these ghosts that are going to come through the television sets and and take your firstborn or something, and they're going to go into a coma of some kind. Very dark stuff, and um, and everybody's going to be at a loss for what to do. So what what is one thing that this person is afraid of? What is it fear, like, to its core? This could be, like, a normal phobia. It could be um, something that causes, you know, anxiety. It could be something as simple as, like, you know, he has a fear of clowns <laughs> or a fear of... Puppy dogs or ridicule. Okay, I like it. I like it. Let's do that. Let's see, being ridiculed. Okay, being one thing that the mad scientist loves, but and this thing is not evil, or the, the act of loving this thing is not evil. I know we're going to say child. That's kind of the easy thing, but I'm thinking something a little bit more um, you know, menial, maybe something like uh, classical music or television, chocolate or, yeah, okay, maybe a TV show, not just te television in general. Maybe there's a specific show that he likes. Or she likes a specific opportunity to people. TV show. Let's do that. And then, what does it hate? It hates. This is the thing that's gonna. This is the button that's gonna cause it to. It hates incompetency. Mad scientist. Yeah. So this nurse uh, was was in this person's mind uh, completely incompetent and in she dies. Okay. So from here, then now we're getting a sense of what the enemy's total plan is and what the goal is. And if you have ideas, you can start to, on this page, kind of figure out, okay, who's who's working with this person? Um, are there allies? Are there henchmen? Do they have minions? Um, we want to give them names, and we kind of want to think about what they are, what do they do for a living. You can think about um, the normals table. You, you might want to just look at it and choose, or you can roll on that. You know, other interested parties. Uh, this might be interesting. Let's go ahead and roll on that table. 
That is on page. I can't read it because. 133. Thank you. To the top of page 133. 133. Yeah. Uh, so D, D10 roll. Um. Nine, Sisterhood of Divine Retribution. Ah. So Gunslinging right. nuns. That's right. Sisters of Divine Retribution. Retribution. Spell God. There we go. Awesome. Okay. So that's a typo we've got to fix. It's actually Sisters of Divine Retribution, not Sisterhood. That's my bad. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to have nuns with guns involved here somehow. Which is kind of fun. Uh, yeah, always a good thing. Yeah. <clears throat> and then uh, the final showdown. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's roll a new building type. We got sewer slash storm drain. Hmm. Just got a hidden lab or something? <laughs> yeah, okay. I got warehouse public storage. Okay. We'll save that one. Um, let's keep Stuart Storm Drain. Uh, sometimes, sometimes if right off the bat, if I'm like, ah, I don't know what to do with that, I might just hang on to it and see if I can come up with something. Um, let's, uh, let's roll a location, um, <coughs> D100, do you want a US location, or? Uh, just roll a D100 and we'll consult both tables. I got 63 England or Minnesota. Okay. I'm kind of feeling the global aspect of this right now. Um, maybe not so much the states. Uh, I kind of like England here. Well, how about you guys? I don't know. Minnesota's pretty sinister. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Well, I'll leave it there uh, just in case, but uh, if I were to run it, I'd probably go with England. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, this this section here where it says supporting cast, um, that uh, is a repeat. Uh, it should say other things. Um, so, sorry about that. Um, it really is tied more to the briefing, uh, which we'll get into momentarily. Okay, so <clears throat> what we have done right now is we've looked at a starting place, and then we've fleshed out what the bad guys are up to, and sort of what is a general idea of what's, what's happening here. Um, from here, what we can do is... Um, to roll and flesh out the briefing. And the briefing, how this is different, and again, from here, you might be done. You might be, this is everything that I need to know how to run my session. I've got people that I can, I have DMCs I can create, or I'm going to use some pre-generated ones. Uh, I've got some locations. I've got ideas where to go. I'm done. I don't need to do anything. Um, but for people like me, I like to go one step further, and that is, now let's create the story that will be presented to the demon hunters. This doesn't necessarily have to be what we just rolled. They might be coming at it from an entirely different standpoint. And so now we're going to roll on the triggering event. This is the thing that 23. Caught, on a 23, okay, this is the thing that caught the yeah. attention. And what did we get on the 23? Sudden insanity. Sudden insanity. Yeah, I like it. Sudden insanity. And who 
became suddenly insane. Rolling on the normal. Now, this is, again, uh, where we can make a decision. We can say the scientist from the teaser. We can say a nurse. We can, or we can roll a new one. And so if we rolled a new one, what, what did we come up with? A uh, worker at the building type. So worker at the home studio or... Well, we're going we're gonna to roll that here in a second. Okay, building time. Okay. We can keep this or not. Um, uh, so where it takes place, um, let's skip the featured creature for now because we have worker at building type, so we want to... Um, so this is, again, um, sort of lost in translation between me and my layout guy. Where it takes place, this should actually have the different fields spelled out again, so building type, location type, location... Uh, but let's just do a shortcut. Let's do a building type. 54. Okay, what do we got there? So, a police station. Ah. And, uh, yeah, roll me a D100 for location. This is probably going to tell us where where everything really is located. Two hundred. Uh, twenty six. Twenty six. So we have Russia. Russia uh, Oklahoma. Or sorry, no. Arkansas. Arkansas. Uh. So Russia or Arkansas. Kansas. Okay. We'll come back to that. Now, we have featured creature. So, once again, a worker at a police station suddenly went insane. Uh, and so we can... Well, this is see. where it takes place, though, right? Oh, it's yeah. the worker at the building type. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, so this is, again, the opening case. This is the scene where the, the demon hunters get called in. So they're probably going to go to a police station to investigate um, because somebody at the police station went insane. And they, they're going to have some ideas of what creature caused this. So let's go to the featured creature section. Uh, and let's roll this twice. I got it. 46 cultist for one. Cultist. Sounds good. All right. And someone roll me another one. Uh, 68. 68 is a cryptid. It was Bigfoot. <laughs> the Bigfoot's killing him. Yeah. Uh, let's throw one more in there just in case. Um, 20? 20 is an angel for Valkyrie. Awesome. Okay. So I have some suspects here. And any one of these could, could it, you know, the idea is that any one of these could uh, drive a person insane. And so... These can be red herrings. They can be um, uh, just leads, you know, um, that sort of thing. Sometimes I've utilized this where, uh, like, the cryptid or the angel might be mascots of a sports team or something. Uh, you know, work it in however you think uh, is helpful. Um, and let's go ahead and go back to the mission objective. On page 129, 130, something like that. D100 roll. Uh, 84. Redeem Eight. enemy slash create double at agent. Redeem enemy. Okay. Fits in nice with the scientist. It does. It does. I like this already. Okay, so... 
Um, I'm not going to worry about the additional normals or special equipment at the moment. Uh, somebody roll me a D6. Tell me what they get. I got a three. Okay. So, in general, uh, this is what I would say. Uh, I, I kind of spell out, if you roll a D6 and you get a five or a six, then um, maybe we'll decide that there's a big picture mission and a big picture enemy. Um, but in this case, there isn't. We rolled a three. And we might just sort of leave it at that. Um, but if you wanted to, we could go over here and decide if... Let's say, for instance, the big picture mission is a one die ten roll, and that mission would be somebody roll me a seven or eight. <laughs> I got a, I got a seven. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Well, uh, Steph said seven, and that was the magic number that I was looking for, which was um, prevent horrific mad science uh, or mystic arts plot. <laughs> this, is one of, this is one of those hand wave situations. Uh, it fits the best. Yeah. Um, well, the one that you rolled was roll again on the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mission and, table. Right. right, which I say up here in the kidnap, yeah. we, might, we might still be doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, so it can right. still apply. Um, and then the big picture enemy, uh, that's going to be on the next page, another D10. I'm going to laugh if someone rolls a 7. I rolled a 7. Did you really? I did really. <laughs> okay. Technically a 7D, but yes. All right, so uh, big picture enemy is literally um, scientific researchers. Oh, Wahaha, which is the Mad Science Union. That's right. Um, all right. <clears throat> Just starting to shape up. <clears throat> All right. Well, that is the five minutes to mayhem. Now it took us a lot longer than that, but uh, but typically, if you're familiar with this, you could literally take five minutes and roll this all up and kind of think about where you're going from here. Then you can kind of decide. So this additional normals uh, could be fleshed out with this over here. What this really means is um, you want to be thinking about witnesses, um, key contacts. Um, those kinds of things. And you can roll on normals, you can roll on even featured creatures if you know some of the other things are involved, or you can just kind of write some ideas that you come into there. Um, what do you, so are you feeling relatively comfortable with a, a plot for this so far? Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 A lot to work with here on this one. Um, so then, what the heck is the rest of this crap on here? So we got a bad piece and mission agenda and these Sinestra and stakes questions, and then we've, then we've got these, uh, you know, four threats here. Um, and this is where we can really kind of expand on this a bit more. Um, so Sinestra are sinister things or events. This is the clock that's ticking. So you want to think about if, the, given everything that we've talked about right now, if the demon hunters do not get involved, these are the things that will happen. Now, they don't necessarily have to be in order, but sometimes it's easier to think that way. Um, so let's think about that right now. Let's flesh out. So... Um, the first thing that's going to happen, if the demon hunters don't get involved, um, what is a, what's one event that's going to happen? I would the... say like a series of unexplained comas striking in random places. 
Okay, you kind of broke up a little bit there. I heard something about random comas. Um, so people, uh, so series of random comas in children's hospitals. Okay, so uh, increased, oops, increased uh, comas in children at. Uh, children's hospitals. Okay. And maybe insanity within their caregivers? Yeah, uh, so... Um, That's a good one. Sudden insanity uh, with uh, someone connected to them? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. No one does anything about it. What's next? What's going to happen next? What's another thing? And again, it doesn't have to be like an increase of this. It could be a, a separate random thing. Um, but it's again, it's sometimes easier to think about smoke than fire than bonfire. Possessed children start getting up and moving around. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> Best children begin uh, getting up and moving around. They are possessed by ghosts or wraiths. Is that right? Yeah, that's what we were thinking of, right? Yeah. yeah. By ghosts, wraiths. Interestingly enough, with the uh, exorcist, Movies. That's what ends up being explained. It's not a demon, but a a ghost of somebody. Um, good. Um, okay. So they're they're happening. So if they're ghosts or wraiths or poltergeists, they're probably already insane, as ghosts are. Um, are they are they killing people? Eventually. Eventually. Um, they could also, drive drive people insane. Yeah, I also thought about like some sort of like infectious possessions. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I like that. Where it um, jumps to their caregiver, yeah, jumps to wherever they go. Yeah, uh, infectious. Possessions, um, violent insanity. Violent insanity. I like that. Um, with uh, nearby people. Um, and then ultimately, like this is like the whole town's on fire, kind of. Scenario. What's it, what's the big big event that's going to lead up to the um, the mad scientists creating the worst uh, society? Which, by the way, the mission agenda is going to be a variation of create the worst society. We're going to come back to that um, and and get a little bit more specific with that, but. The mad um, scientist throws the switch and it goes through all the TVs throughout all the world. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's great. So, um, uh, enough connection uh, throughout the world with um, uh, ghosts and infection. And uh, switch is uh, flipped, affecting everyone worldwide watching TV. And the world goes insane, and yeah, this is huge. This is awesome. And this is like the worst society of insane, rabid people. Uh, 
doing strange things. Okay, so stakes questions, these are the questions that you don't know the answer to. You know, these are like what what is it, you know, what's at stake here? Um, you know, so for instance, um, uh, you know, let's see. Will the scientists uh, child ever recover? No. Um, and, very, and so on. You know, just different things that you can think of that that would come about. And so the bad piece here, this is sort of the status quo. This is the um, this is the thing that there's an uneasiness, or there's a when the hunters arrive on the scene, there is a there's a general you know the way things are operating right now, and so maybe right now there a bad piece that we can talk about is like um, a uh, general mistrust of the medical community. Um, uh, oh, regarding mental health. So, in other words, uh, there may be a lot of uh, propaganda or a lot of um, stuff in the media about that, and so doctors are even more under the gun of this kind of thing. And so, the triggering event, the you know, the police. You know, person at the police station who goes suddenly insane just it breaks this bad piece. It, it, um, it, it sets things in motion. In other words, uh, and uh, now there are legislation happening, or maybe there's uh, PTA meetings, or you know, various stuff like that. Um, and so from here, then, uh, if you're gonna, uh, one of the things that can be helpful is to flesh out uh, some threats. And threats are basically just the, the things that are threatening to the players themselves, to the player characters, uh, the demon hunters. And um, this is in the 60 minutes to mayhem section. And it's not going to take us 60 minutes to go through it. We're going to do one example and then kind of talk about the others. But uh, these have a very similar structure to the mission that we just built with the Sinestra and the agenda and things like that. Um, we have different categories uh, for these threats, and these are uh, um, starting on page 145, I believe. And so probably the easiest one to think of is the mad scientist. And the mad scientist, there are, um, there are six categories of uh, threats, and threats are overlords, brutes, conspirators, uh, civilians, danger zones, or scourges. And so when you look at uh, the overlords um, and the brutes, maybe, those are probably the two types of threats that our mad scientist might fall under. But, you know, he's got pretty grandiose plans, so I, I would imagine that he's going to be, an, he or she is going to be an overlord. Um... So let's choose a, an overlord type. Um, you know, false prophet, uh, misguided visionary. Destroyer is destroyer, ruin everything. To ruin everything, to tear down. Yeah, that could, that could happen. Uh, sorcerer, to tame or control uh, forces. The puppet master, to possess and control from the shadows. You know, any of any one of these. Uh, what do we feel the strongest about? I'd probably say destroy. Destroy. If it was. Yeah. Okay. So then we're just going to write uh, to unmake, to ruin everything. Uh. 
to tear down. Yeah, we get the idea. It's kind of like the Joker here from Dark Knight. All right. So this is, again, kind of thinking about our mad science. So this is a mad scientist of... Uh, oh, ha, ha. Um, and then we might discuss a little bit more about who this person is. And in this regard, the Sinestra might be the same thing that we just... For, for the main villain, I've often found that there's a lot of overlap with the overall mission. But when we think about the threat, when we and I'll we'll move on to another one, and that will clarify how the Sinestra can work. Um, and again, the threat agenda is going to be the same as the, as the mission agenda in this case, because it's really the overlord here that's trying to achieve their goal. And the threat agenda is just that. It's the ultimate goal of what this threat wants to accomplish. It's the realization of, of the world um, in, that, in that thing. So let's uh, kind of skip on to the next one here, though. Uh, what are some other things, other things in, in our uh, discussion here of, that could be threats? With the possessed, possessed children? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so those are probably going to be under the Brutes category, I would imagine. Yeah. And let's pick a type there. Let's see, Brutes. Um, could be Beast. Could be Horde, Swarm and Destroy. Um, uh, cult. Cult, Victimize and Incorporate. Yeah. What do we like there? Scott, do you have a preference? Yeah, you don't want my preference. <laughs> I think torture. Torture? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Oh, yeah. like, I guess. They're causing yeah. insanity in people around them. Yeah. I didn't, I'm like, I didn't torture answer. myself. Too. Okay. Let's do it. So... Uh, to gain pleasure by inflicting pain. Um, so these are uh, ghosts and um, uh, ghost pos possessed children. Okay. So now we're when we think of the Sinestra, these are the things that are only tied to this threat. Not the this has nothing to do with a mad scientist. So these are things like, um, you know, the first thing is, uh, you know, five kids come out of a coma. Uh, kind of crazy. Um, and then uh, Nurse Brittany gets horribly murdered. And then uh, uh, Dr. Hank it's blamed for malpractice. <laughs> and hospital is uh, under scrutiny. Hospital tries to cover it up. Oh, yeah. I like that. And hospital, there you go, covers up. And, you know, um, uh, well, I suppose if they haven't figured it out or treated the children, wouldn't that maybe be the point where it starts to spread? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, ghost can 
contagion spreads. Uh, more people go insane. Moves to new areas. Yeah, moves to new areas. Uh, I just have one suggestion. Yeah. Okay. I think it should be Nurse Hank and Dr. Brittany. Okay. <laughs> Nurse Hank? Yeah, and Dr. Brittany. Okay, let's do that. Um, no, 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 no. Yeah. Cool. Okay, not exactly, but that's okay. Yeah. He meant, he meant Dr. Brittany's the one who goes crazy and is responsible, and Nurse Hank's the one who gets horribly murdered. Oh, I see. Which I like that. I, that's, that's good, too. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Perfect. There we go. And the threats agenda is to um, uh, well uh, is to gain pleasure by inflicting pain so uh, hurt everyone <laughs> badly. <laughs> um, okay. You know, other things might be that are threatening are like the Sisters of Divine Retribution. Somebody's there. If you want to work that in, that could be a conspirator or a, a brute in some way, possibly. Um, it could be. How do the nuns feel about blasting children? Uh, I think they're a scourge. Yeah, scourge are... I was are, just going to say that, too. Scourge are um, non-people threats. The scourges are not actually uh, uh, people oh. themselves. Uh, scourges are conditions or situations or ideas that are threatening. Okay. Um, you know... It's like plagues and propaganda and stuff like that. Um, so righteous uh, brutes is a righteous executioner. Yeah, it could be. In fact, actually, that's probably that that's a really be. good, <laughs> a really good example of what the sisters are as righteous ex executioners. Um, but they probably, yeah, I don't know. There's probably a fine line. If they're possessed and they think that there's no going back, then Aren't they, like, totally against magic, too? So, I mean, if there's a magical yeah. threat, then they're probably blasting it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, another thing might be if we look at our location. Where are locations? We have a uh, film studio. We have a police station. Um, we keep talking about a hospital. Maybe we ought to swap one of these out for a hospital. Um, and make Maybe the... Uh, Maybe this steward swarm drain is actually in the bottom of a hospital. That would be great, yeah. Uh, make, Final a, showdown make the at film the studio a hospital. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So now you're getting it. And so maybe the location is a danger zone. Um, and it is, let's say, a labyrinth that is confusing and entrapping. Or it's a... Uh, uh, you know, prison. It's not letting anybody out kind of thing. And you would develop its own... Maybe that's the stages of, in, of insanity leading to uh, being uh, possessed. Yeah, okay. Uh, so you start hallucinating and such. Right. I like it. So, as you can see, you can, you can really use this system here to get a very good sense of what's happening. And the reason why I find this useful is even if you're running a one-off session or, or whatever, if you flesh this out, you get a really good sense of what's happening on a larger picture. And so when your players do things you're not expecting, um, you have an idea of what's happening and how those can affect other things that are going on. It just helps you be better prepared, I think. Um, but again, you can use as much or as little as you want. Um, and, uh, you know, and then we always talk about the 
the mission Sinestra here, one of the things that you could do is make the agenda for each of these. These are the things that will happen, or the, these are the ultimate things that are going to happen if the threats get what they want. And you could make those events the Sinestra of the whole larger mission kind of thing. Um, that's one way. But this is just a tool to help you uh, get a sort of a roadmap of uh, of an adventure, a mission. And from there, then you would be able to go. Okay, grab a few note cards, make some DMCs, and off you go. So yep. that ends my presentation. Further questions? Probably, but none I can think of. Yeah. For, any, for anyone who may not be aware of it, there's a Google Plus group. We could probably, y'all, Don and Cam have been around a lot, so they could probably bounce questions off there too. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, we definitely hang around in that <clears throat> community. So um, Scott's created that uh, on there. And then if you're um, on Facebook, uh, there is a Brotherhood of the Celestial Torch Facebook group. You can join that, and um, we can answer questions there as well. Um, but I like the community on Google+. Plus. It's really focused around this thing, and it looks like a really good tool and engagement. Is it the, are you talking about the Dead Gentleman Hangout, uh, or is there another one? No, there's a, so on Google+, Plus there is a, they, what they call communities, and yeah, you can yeah. build one around, so there's one specifically built for, Scott built one uh, a couple of days ago for the Demon Hunters role-playing game. Oh. Uh, you can join that and bounce ideas off of, you know, get questions and find resources. Uh, so we have a question here. Thank you, Scott. Uh, when this has an official release, will you be selling it? And if so, how much? Will you be distributing it yourselves, or will it be at our local game stores? Uh, all of the above. Uh, the answer is yes, we will be selling it. Um, I'm trying to build uh, our online store, uh, dead.market. We'll be selling uh, directly retail on that, uh, but also uh, through Amazon. And then Paizo is our um, wholesale distributor, and they are the ones that can get it to your local game store. And so um, if your local game store is not carrying it, ask them, because they will have access to that. Uh, but the release probably won't happen until um, September or October as far as retail side of things. Um, Kickstarter fulfillment hopefully will be happening in uh, September. And all right, so our viewers are dwindling down. I think I'm going to wrap this up. Um, thank you, everyone. And this has been recorded, so we'll go ahead and post links in the YouTube video um, and with uh, Google uh, group as well as uh, the website where you can download these materials. And uh, thank you all for uh, watching and participating. And hope to see you soon. Enjoy the game. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having us.